Hi, Dan Kurz, DK Analytics. Thanks a lot for tuning in. It is April 7th, 2017. Uh, we apologize for a more lengthy than normal uh, break from reappearing to you in video format. We'll follow this up before all too long with posts, uh, with a post on, on the similar uh, issues. Uh, we've had some technical slash hosting issues. Some of you might be aware of them, but uh, hopefully the better late than never is, is apt here. Uh, let's go through the, the sustained divergence, our view of what is a divergence between negative underlying developments, whether they're economic, financial, or political, and uh, also how that juxtaposes against still blue sky uh, bond and stock valuations, extreme bond bubbles and, and stock bubbles. In essence, traditional assets divorced from uh, the mayhem uh, that we see around the corner as it eventually impacts valuations of so-called traditional assets. We, we kind of look at it as being stuck in the eye of, uh, of, of uh, a major storm. And if we look out three miles, we're able to, to, to walk three miles out, we'd be facing 220 mile per hour winds. Uh, and so far we've remained in the eye, but there are so many black swans or things that can conspire to reduce confidence that at any point in time, uh, reality might beckon and uh, major players might head for exits, which will overwhelm central banks and cause a revaluation reset in these bubble assets. And, and as we know from experience or as we've discussed multiple times, uh, in, in report or post and also video format. We go from boom to bust. We spend precious little time at average valuations. We definitely have boom, a financial repression based boom, asset valuations, guarantees of central bank puts. If things go awry, a lot of money printing, uh, artificially low interest rates and all that other stuff, which in essence has forced people into stocks and has artificially levitated bond prices and has resulted in a whole slew of issues uh, which we'll get into here uh, in short order. But let's walk through some of the challenges uh, economically, financially, um, and politically. And again, juxtapose those against pie in the sky, uh, absolutely ridiculous in, in our view, bond and stock valuations, and this pretty much on a global basis. Let's start here at home in the United States. Um, if we take a look at industrial production, it's been in decline for a record consecutive seven quarters. Never happened. Un unprecedented. Uh, usually two quarters of negative industrial production, which, by the way, is 60 percent or so of economic output, despite the small sliver of the population involved in manufacturing, which is the largest part of industrial uh, production. And so this is this is a big deal. And, uh, you know, look out below or caveat and tour in terms of buying stocks in such an environment. Uh, the U.S. cash freight index down two months in a row. Uh, and it, this is kind of like a complementary indicator to declining industrial production. We've got, in the meantime, U.S. inventory to sales ratio, which are at a, at a high level compared to the last 10 year average outside of a recession. If economic weakness continues, it suggests that uh, obviously less needs to be built and inventories need to be cleared or sold off. And that is not good for GDP growth, as one can imagine. We've got auto sales, which have been going great guns thanks to artificially low financing and lease rates. United States It's a two month low uh, here that we're in that uh, is, is occurring, all right, despite massive uh, rebates and discounting uh, there. It's difficult for Detroit and all the foreign car makers to move the metal. And uh, they have fallen now, despite all these incentives, to, to a, a two-month, a multi-year, two-month low. Uh, meanwhile, auto delinquencies have risen uh, to roughly $30 a billion dollars, the highest level in since 2007. Um, this is going to make lease values. A lot of people lease, they don't buy cars anymore. Higher, that is, I'm sorry, lower 
meaning people have to pony up or pay more. Uh, in other words, uh, car prices for the average person that leases uh, or finances are going to go up, which is in and of itself inflationary on one hand, and promises a lot of pressure on corporate profits in the auto sector on the other. Um, we've got increasingly slow, lethargic U.S. retail sales. A lot of people have come out and said, well, people are migrating to online. They don't go to malls or strip centers anymore. Well, of retail sales in aggregate in the United States, only 8% or so are online. So that's, uh, that has to be looked at with caution. It's the, it's the traditional retail establishment where most things are still uh, purchased in the retail space and they are weak. This is also shown by a lot of store closings by leading merchants, Sears, uh, obviously Kmart, bankruptcies. We've got record amounts of store shutterings, closings, and chains going out of business, which is together with the sales that uh, go on and the lacking purchasing power of consumers is going to also really hit the corporate profits in this sector uh, to, combined with the auto sector. So and not exactly good for corporate profits for economic growth. To add insult to injury, the first quarter, uh, Q1-17 uh, merchandise trade deficit is set for a quarterly record. That is the worst since 2007. Uh, so that's another drag on first quarter uh, real GDP growth in the United States. And again, contrast this to the rally in stocks, okay, and uh, PE of uh, 25 times trailing earnings. U.S. government receipts, meanwhile, also corporate, which is about 20%, are starting to roll over. That typically in the past has been indicative of a recession. Uh, we've got the U.S. federal deficit in 16, the declared deficit expanded by 34% and is is looking to, well, is likely to expand further in this fiscal year and in September uh, 17. We've got uh, U.S. productivity, which is thanks to the toxic public policy stew. We keep mentioning a move away from property right protection, stout rule of law, uh, regulatory and tax sanity, litigation sanity. These things are all not available. America, in this sense, and unfortunately, quite a a large part of the world are not truly open for business. We don't have free market capitalism anymore in a nutshell. So productivity is showing this, and a lot of it is due to the misallocations engendered by sustained money printing and artificially low interest rates and the lack of financing availability by, by small companies uh, that are the bread and butter of new jobs and productivity. Um, so that's, a, that's negative. In fact, U.S. productivity uh, since 07 is 40% lower as measured by the Department of Labor than pre-07. So we've got a 40% lower productivity rate uh, per output or per, per worker. They tabulated only 1.1%, again, down 40% from the prior period, prior to the 07 debacle. And this is actually an overstatement of productivity given an understated inflation rate. And it's echoed around the world. If we have total factor productivity, uh, we are actually not only in very weak global productivity growth, but we're moving into actual negative productivity or less output, which is very, very difficult for any economy and in terms of growth and job creation and, and is also, frankly, the other side of all this debt that we've needed to add to sustain even a, a very small increment of growth because it hasn't been productivity based. Meanwhile, uh, and this is to be expected given all the, the, the money printing and central bank policies, uh, despite velocity being down, they've printed so much money at the monetary base level. Uh, and this despite a strong dollar, as you know, the United States dollar is the least ugly duckling of the fiat currencies are so considered. But U.S. inflation, uh, which is actually as measured by the government, 
virtually non-existent in, in 1415, uh, crept up in 16 or in 15 and 16, close to zero, and it's now running at a 2.8% rate, the CPI for urban consumers. If one steps back from the canvas and recalculates or looks at the CPI the way the government used to do it in the 90s, then that would, that would equal a 6% inflation rate. And if we go back to the dial all the way back to the 80s uh, and used that metric and didn't do funny business with the donic inflation or adjustments, uh, substitution, and uh, an and absolutely incorrect amount of the average consumption spending being medical, uh, you know, instead of 20%, more like two or three, that's how it's erroneously weighted. Why then today's inflation rate measured by the 80s standard would be close to 10% for urban consumers, 6% as measured by the, by the 80s or by the 90s rather, and today we're at 2.8%. Uh, from an essence zero uh, year or two back. So inflation is heading the wrong direction. And this also, uh, in, in fact, brings down the real rate of GDP growth. If one used the real inflation number, it's possible that we never got out of the recession uh, because if you deflate nominal GDP by a real inflation rate, we would probably have negative, at least nominally negative GDP a growth that is, we would have a reflection of the corporate world where S&P 500 sales per share, if one adds back in the stock buybacks and looks at it in that manner, would be down some 30% or so from Q307. So what the GDP numbers, the real GDP growth fails to tell us because of our inflation rate corporate results stripped of stock buybacks uh, do show. And that is, it's not a very sustainable recipe uh, for future earnings per share growth because it is devoid of organic top line growth. It's a result of low interest rates, low cost of funding, share buybacks and cost cutting. It's not a, it's not a way to sustain uh, growth or employment levels going forward. Um, it, it, it's kind of like, uh, corporate uh, anorexia. Meanwhile, the cost of Obamacare remains, as you've surely heard, uh, the, there was a big to-do with, uh, with the Republican takeover, not only the presidency, but both houses, both, both chambers of Congress, but they couldn't repeal what they promised they would, which is no big surprise given the cronyism and the statism and at, at stake here and the way that these people's bread is buttered. None of them have to live under Obamacare. They've all excluded themselves. Uh, so they have a different take than, than the people that have to struggle with it. So the upshot of all this is we've got families, healthcare outlays, we've got uh, that have, are outstripping mortgage payments, all right? And rhino care, so-called repeal and name only, uh, which uh, the Republicans in Congress wanted to foist upon Americans and, and Trump gave his blessing on, would have done Obamacare one worse, not one better, because it would have taken out the penalties of not signing up, meaning that the insured pool becomes ever more aged and sick because people no longer have an incentive to sign up and can, that's the equivalent of purchasing car insurance after you've had a car accident or fire insurance after your house is burned down. So what happens is for those that have to get insurance because they can't risk losing their homes or and they have families to protect and couldn't afford the out-of-pocket, their premiums rise and rise or would have risen even more robustly than Obamacare, as would the self-pays, the deductibles, or, and the whole thing uh, would have gone from bad to worse. But Long story short, Obamacare is still with us. The Republicans don't mean business. They don't want to let the free market address this. More choice across state lines. And as a result, we have the drag of Obamacare, which is nothing other than redistributionism, often to illegal aliens in the country. And as a result, we're going to continue to stymie 
small businesses availability to add the 50th employee. Big corporations will continue to go from full-time to part-time. And we have both a big drag on disposable income and jobs. And as you know, consumption is 60, 65% of GDP. So this does not bode well for fixing what really ails American economy perhaps more than anything else right now, and that is Obamacare. So it's here to stay. Uh, Trump promised to repeal it. We now see, unfortunately, uh, when push comes to shove, his left blinker comes on, his New York City leftism, cronyism. Uh, you can see his cabinet, his Department of Commerce choice, his Department of Treasury choice, his Department of Transportation choice. These are statists. They're, they're, they're Goldman Sachs people. They believe in weakening free market capitalism, extending the toxic public policy stew whether it's big government, more spending, regulatory overreach, bailouts, bail-ins. Actually, the Donald doesn't appear to be wearing his constitutional hat too much other than his Supreme Court uh, candidate choice, which is obviously a very solid one. In a nutshell, it doesn't look like we're going to be moving to a more constructive uh, economic and uh, property right protecting rule of law environment. That's what ails the beast, together with litigation excesses, which are never discussed, which some of you might know Donald Trump availed himself of very liberally, uh, including, uh, you know, threatening subcontractors with non-payment of work done, go sue me, because he had more lawyers. So these, these things all together constitute what we unkindly call a public, a toxic public policy stew. And that looks unfortunately more like, we have also thought this in the past, that this is gonna stay on board. So we're really not gonna solve what ails the beast. Instead, we're gonna to have to double down on fiat money and fiat government, i.e. the rule of law isn't here. And the 1% the one gets to shield itself from what it imposes on the rest of us. And this is what ails the beast, if you will. And I'd say to a degree, degree through much of the West, Let's talk about getting spending under control, government spending, U.S. government spending, which uh, is roughly $1 trillion a year or more beyond government receipts. Donald Trump came in and said he was going to attack spending. Well, let's go back, and we mentioned this in a prior post, excuse me, that in effect, Trump has, has promised what? That he would not touch any of the non-discretionary government spending, which comprises, if you include payment on the debt, interest payments, over 71% of federal spending, right? If you now move to the discretionary, which is the other 29%, and 60% of that is off limits, where you actually wanna spend more, whether it's the military, whether it's veterans benefits, whether it's infrastructure, then at the end of the day, you've got, you know, a tenth of the federal budget that you can whack away at to achieve any savings. So you're not going to be able to reduce the spending on the growth of spending in the government unless you open up the entire government spending pie chart to substantial cuts to get it to line back up with the revenues that the government collects and stop adding a trillion plus to future generations IOUs. But this isn't going to happen. And this is obviously what suggests that we're gonna to continue to go down an unsustainable path uh, financially and as a result, sadly, economically. Uh, and in that sense, I'm gonna argue also politically. So we've got all these pressure points building, 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 yet, Bonds and stocks are priced for perfection and beyond in the United States and in, in much of the world. Speaking of much of, of the world, we see Chinese exports declining sharply for the second month in a row in 17. We see central bank balance sheets that continue to balloon. We have global debt, again, the poster child of failing productivity, 
We're not getting growth through greater output per man hour, but by adding debt. The globe added $7.6 trillion in interest-bearing debt last year and had very weak real GDP growth, real GDP growth, which is probably flattered by not just in the U.S., by much of the world, an understated rate of real world inflation. Over the last 10 years, in fact, global debt is up by 70 trillion. We currently have a global debt, just the interest bearing the, the portion of it, that is more than three times GDP, right? And at some point, confidence is here is going to get lost and we're going to have a revaluation of the bond market. And that means higher discount rates, lower bond prices, because we're expanding both the monetary inflation risks by bulging the globe's central bank balance sheet. And at some point, that's why the central bankers do it, the transmission mechanism of a lower money multiplier is not going to continue to fall and pop, it's gonna show up in the money supply. So we have greater much greater monetary uh, inflation risk and huge solvency risks. This debt can never be repaid, which forces uh, central bankers and politicians' hand to, in essence, print to pay, which means, which in effect guarantees, even if you, we fall into a debt-induced deflation, that that's going to be responded to with renewed vigor, untold vigor, with the printing press. And by the way, historically, and I've mentioned that elsewhere, we get into um, periods of hyperinflation, usually through, through countries that can print money that aren't tethered to gold and silver, the disciplines of above ground gold and silver. We've never been in a situation where the entire globe has been untethered from the discipline of, of above, ground, above ground gold and silver stocks. So this time around, we are really un in uncharted waters and the growth in debt is reflective of the growth in the balance sheets in central banks. And as a result, we also have this overhang, this debt overhang that, as I said, it's debt-induced deflation, thanks to being able to print money to bring this debt into existence in the first place. That has always historically been the precursor to hyperinflation. Now, I'm not saying we get hyperinflation, but we could revisit stagflation, the 70s, except this time on steroids, given the excesses that we built, much higher debt, much lower productivity, uh, older population, less favorable demographics, and all these things come together and politicians do what politicians will do. People get paid. It's just that the money they're going to get paid in is worth less. We also, I believe, are sure at this point of anyone that's looking at pension, uh, their defined pension plans, 401ks, uh, all these plans, which are not bringing returns thanks to the monetary policies of central banks, which in essence is yield deprivation. You save the banks first, you bail them out in the back of the taxpayer, and then you, you nurture them back to health by taking the toxic assets and nationalizing them in effect, in effect uh, on the central bank's balance sheets. And then you move to keep interest rates very low and let them heal, if you will. And this obviously has a steep cost in terms of misallocations, in terms of smaller businesses not having access to that capital. And very importantly, for savers and, and retirees and people dependent upon earning a decent income, based upon the assets they have in CDs or in money markets. We no longer have these people earning anything, and this is becoming a very serious issue. And it's another potentially politically destabilizing development, which is might be the black swan. There's this whole squadron of them, unfortunately, that could take the confidence away in our fiat money and sadly fiat government based system which rules the roost today so once again caveat emptor contrast that juxtapose that against the asset bubbles in especially bonds the most overvalued assets of all and stocks too and look at it as an opportunity if you will to rejigger your portfolios your investable assets out of harm's way 
uh, because this is not only a huge risk, it's a gigantic future opportunity to purchase those assets less at less prices. But let's look at a few, I'm sorry, to purchase stocks and bonds at lower prices. Let's look at a couple political black swans, go through a quick list, if you will. How many of you know that after 9-11 and George Bush declared a state of emergency, that the U.S. federal government is still operating under a state of emergency, which is one step away from instituting martial law, meaning suspending the Constitution formally instead of informally, meaning Bill of Rights protections, property right protections, separation of powers, federalism, which is all, you know, hanged by a thread, is taken out entirely. Now you talk about something that would upset confidence, right? And, and again, we are running on confidence fumes. Stocks and bonds are not valued by any rational return expectations. It's greater fool theory as the central banks have your back. They will sustain or push up stock and bond values to protect the banks that ultimately are so exposed to so many things going wrong, including the derivative book, which is over $400 trillion of bets that the leading banks have made that interest rates are going to stay low or go lower. If that Apple card is upset, then they're not money good. And we've got this huge counterparty risk that can, in essence, freeze up the credit markets and cause traumatic, traumatic uh, global financial and economic instability. Think about the U.S. debt limit uh, that needs to be raised again. The, the Congress operates in a continuing resolution to see our basis. They never agree to a budget till about half a year too late. This too could get unruly or threaten confidence if they don't raise the debt limit, which simply means you're not going to live within your means again and again. But this could unnerve markets if it combines with any other things that are less than stabilizing. Banks, I mentioned, are bigger than ever. Uh, huge counterparty derivative risks, huge exposure to the status quo of interest rates staying lower, going lower. Citizens, but that financed the big bank bailouts are now susceptible to bail-ins, that their savings accounts of banks might be used to support bank balance sheet in case they have a huge implosion in asset values, and that takes out the equity, which is typically only about 8% of the balance sheet. Now, mind you, those same taxpayers have suffered the zero interest rate policy, the QE that has pushed down rates in the long end. So they've been victims of yield deprivation and haven't had a return on their hard earned money, much less, you know, even beating inflation. They're, they're, they're having negative returns. And if they now also have to face this, this, this a bail in scenario, that is something else that should could cause people to truly no longer accept the status quo and is one of the series of black swans which might cause this whole thing to come apart at the seams. We also don't have, this time around, in contrast to 2008, money market liquidations can be stopped. They, they can be stopped by the, by the laws that are currently on the books. In, in the OECD part of the world. So uh, what I'm trying to say is if people that save assets, that have accounts, bank accounts, CDs, money markets, and they go and they try to say, okay, we're not comfortable with what's going on. We want to take some of the money out. We want to take dollar notes out, right? Uh, we want to get cash. We want to put it in our safe, what have you. They're going to find that in the next time this thing comes apart at the seams, it's going to be much harder for them uh, to access the liquidity uh, in that they want to bring into their homes or bring it stored in a safe place in a vault in terms of actually taking notes out of the system, which is also why the banks around the world want the shift from paper money, currency, which, you know, notes, bills, to purely electronic so they can keep everyone in the electronic uh, bail uh, in uh, arena and not lose critical uh, deposits, which typically account for 30, 40, 50% of banks' uh, balance sheet. 
So in a nutshell, record or near record uh, bond in stock bubbles. Uh, fundamentals going in the wrong direction, whether financially, economically, including productivity. Uh, politically, I, I hope I've made a point. And, you know, you're, I don't know if any of you around in the 80s, but it used to be that, you know, stogies all of a sudden became fine cigars and everybody bought all these contraptions and I think they're called humidors and, 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 all, and then overnight they became stinky stogies again. I'm just wondering to make perhaps a poor parallel when this is going to happen, especially given the black swans that we have everywhere that could bring this whole confidence and fiat money and fiat government down in a hurry. And bond vigilantes and others massively overwhelmed central banks. Recall there are about $300 trillion in investable assets. 70, 75% of those are bonds. If people run for the hills or get convinced that central banks can no longer support bond prices, then this whole thing can unravel in a hurry. And that obviously also makes stocks a lot less attractive valuation wise. So again, it's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. We have a gift bestowed upon us by the cronies, by the central bankers, uh, by the people like the establishment, the 1% that's gotten richer than God, at usually at the expense of, of of the rule of law, of meritocracy, of a robust system of free market capitalism, uh, property right protection, you know, boring stuff like that. They are not gonna let this thing fall, but inevitably gravity works. And let their asset bubble landscape valuation gift be your ticket to reduce your exposure to these insane valuations that are totally devoid of reality and await a reversion beyond the mean, meaning when you can get a lot, uh, high yield from bonds, a low PE from stocks, high dividend yields, and the interim go to safe cash at the margin, go to cash on steroids, which are precious metals in physical format held outside of the banking system. And recall this, history repeats. Again, we never have reversion to the mean. We have reversion beyond the mean, we go from boom valuations, zero interest rates, 30 PEs, to 10% interest rates and eight PEs. That's what the 70s also show us. And when confidence breaks and the system which has impoverished the vast majority of the people for the benefit of the 1%, when this thing goes, you may not be able to sell your bubble valuation bonds and stocks at anywhere near today's levels and thus not protect capital on the one hand and avail yourself of a dramatic and a huge opportunity to purchase bonds and stocks at what will inevitably be much more attractive prices and valuations. We hope this makes some sense. We hope to follow up on this with a post. Thank you for your patience with us. Bye-bye.